Hello, my name is Scott Agster, and I'm a proud member of the Twin Cities Musicians Union, Local 3073 AFM. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about the different gear you'll need to be able to up your game on your home recordings and on your home presentations through online lessons. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what sound is and the different types of gear that are involved in the signal chain, all the way from the original sound to your computer where you, where you will be able to manipulate the sound. So the first question that we have to answer to understand how all this stuff works is what is sound? So sound is actually mechanical pressure caused by the vibration of a source of sound stirring up the air molecules so that they're mechanically compressing and contracting from the source of the vibration all the way into the place it's received. So in general, we think of sounds as waves. And the best way to describe this is, as it travels through a medium, these vibrations, for instance, through air, um, when the molecules contract, we think of that as a peak, and as they expand and become further apart, we think of that as a valley. Frequency is how fast those sound waves are occurring. And the faster the sound waves, the higher the pitch. So we uh, attribute frequency to how fast those sound waves are going up and down. Um, the amount of length between the top and the bottom of the sound wave has to do with how loud or soft something is with dynamics. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is signal chain. Now signal chain is very important because it it tracks the sound from its point of origin all the way through your system until it reaches your computer. So every point in that chain that the signal passes through is an important place where uh, the sound is manipulated. So the first part of the signal chain is the microphone right here. And what the microphone does is basically it converts those uh, sound pressure waves into electric signal, okay? Now there's different types of microphones. And the first microphone I'm going to talk about is a dynamic microphone. And the first microphone uh, brand and model that I want to talk about is the SM58, which is, uh, you'll, you'll see it on stages all the way across the world, uh, and it's used for vocals. Now, even though it's a vocal mic, it can work great for many different instrument applications. It's got a lower price point, I think, probably coming in around $100 right now. It's a very rugged mic and it will last for a very long time as long as you take fairly good care of it. Now when I say these different types of microphones, like a dynamic microphone, um, the information has to do with how the sound pressure is converted into electric signal. So basically the components of the microphone. So one of the greatest characteristics about a dynamic microphone is it can take high SPLs, it can take very loud sounds, um, without distorting. It can also uh, take drastic temperature and humidity shifts. So it's a, it's a pretty rugged microphone. It's not as sensitive, um, a Shure 58. It's not as sensitive as some of the other higher end microphones we're gonna talk about. But again, a great place to start. Um, if you've never done any recording before or any kind of sound reinforcement, I'd recommend just going with something cheap but reliable SM58. So the next microphone I'd like to talk about is a condenser microphone, which is the type I'm using today. Condenser microphones are a little bit more sensitive than dynamic microphones in that uh, they're, they're more sensitive to temperature and humidity and very loud sounds. Um, but a condenser microphone, because it's more sensitive, is very good for picking up some of that crisp high-end information um, for instance, if you play flute or violin or sing high vocals, a condenser microphone is very good at capturing some of those high frequencies. A downside to it, another downside, uh, if you're in a home environment where maybe there's a loud HVAC going on or there's a buzzing of a light or there's you know, street sounds outside, a condenser microphone is much more sensitive, so much more likely to capture some of that other distracting information as well. There's other types of microphones on the market, such as ribbon mics or tube mics. 
but as you get into those types of microphones, the price point starts to shoot way up. And since this is an introductory video, I think I'm going to end my uh, discussion at dynamic mics and condenser mics. The next thing we should talk about are the polar patterns of a microphone. Very important information when you're buying a microphone. So let's go back to the SM58. Because it's an on-stage microphone, uh, you, there's going to be a loud monitor sitting in front of the singer to boost their vocal sounds over the electronic instruments and the drums behind, over the back line, so basically the singer can hear themselves. Because of this, that sound is going to be loudly coming towards the back of the microphone. Okay? And what happens is, imagine this. Have you ever looked into one mirror that's pointed at another mirror and you see an infinite number of yourself because of the way the light refracts? The same thing basically happens with sound. That's a clunky way to describe it, but that's it's just a useful image. So what happens is... Um, sound is being pumped out of the speaker into the microphone and put back through the speaker and it creates this infinite feedback loop and there's certain frequencies that are going to be louder than others and when that happens they blow up and they sound like feedback so that's why you never want to point a microphone at a speaker that's that's producing its sound okay so that's how you get feedback either the microphone's way too loud and it's picking up that speaker sound or it's being pointed at the speaker. So, what does that mean for you? That SM58 is going to have a cardioid pattern, which means it captures sound from the, the front of the microphone, and it goes into a heart shape at the, at the back of the microphone. And the reason it does that is it does not want to pick up sound from the back side of the microphone. So that sound is canceled. Okay, so that's a cardioid pattern. You also have an omnidirectional pattern, and that looks like a, a circle. And what omnidirectional means is that it captures that information from the, an entire 360 degrees around the microphone. Okay, but since we're all in our home spaces, uh, and this is a beginning video, it's likely that you don't have an incredibly acoustic treated space inside your house. So that's why I'd recommend maybe steer away from omnidirectional microphones for the beginning. Another type is figure eight. Again, not super duper useful for a home recording session, but just to talk about it, uh, the pattern is like a figure eight. So on both sides of the microphone, it will cancel out the information, but it will take information from the front and back. What that's good for is if you have musicians sitting next to themselves, okay, you can place the microphone so it's canceling out the information to either side. The next part of the signal chain is your mic cable or your XLR cable and it's called XLR for external line return and that has to do with this three prong connector at each end of the cable. What the microphone cable does is it takes that electrical signal and it moves it a distance away from the microphone. And good microphone cables have lots of shielding in them that keep uh, electrical interference or RF interference from sneaking into the signal and uh, muddying it up. Um, basically radio frequencies, things like that. So don't buy the cheapest mic cable. You don't need the most expensive, but buy something that's going to last a while. Um, just a quick little bit on cable maintenance. Cables have a memory. As you can see, it's coiled in a circle. What we don't do is wrap it like this around the elbow because it needs to be coiled in a loop. Okay, that way you don't have a cable that gets a bunch of, there's wire inside here, and if you put sharp bends in it over time, the cable gets messy and tangly. So the best way to do it, this is a, a sound guy's secret. It's the over under. So I was over, now I go under. Now I go over, now I go under. And what I'm doing is as I go, I'm twisting the cable. So it keeps that memory shape. And the nice thing about going under is it keeps it so that um, the cable is always uh, coiling evenly. Now, that's kind of an advanced technique. You can look that up online, but 
Uh, if you don't have that technique, another thing you can do is just twist with your thumb and keep twisting in the same direction. If you do a good job, basically this cable should be able to be thrown out easily from point A to point B without twisting up or knotting. One more thing about my cables, they make these Velcro straps so that you can keep your cables organized and keep them basically from tangling up with each other. So the next piece of the signal chain is going to be the audio digital interface. So basically what this device does is it converts the electrical signal into ones and zeros so it can be interpreted by your computer. You'll notice on the screen that I put a picture of the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2 USB audio interface and I'm looking on Sweetwater right now and it's $160. Not a bad deal for uh, entry level interface with uh, two slots. So you could add either two different microphones or two different instrument cables into the same device. For teaching, this is a valuable tool for many of us. If you think about it, the amount of volume coming out of the end of my trombone will be completely different from my voice. So having two microphones spaced at different places in the room can help you to be able to talk one volume but play another without overloading your system. So let's take another look at this box. There's a couple features here that are very helpful. You'll notice on those two inputs um, there is a little round slot in the middle that you can insert an instrument cable into so you could actually use this device to record bass or guitar and at the same time those same slots will also accept an XLR cable. There is also if you look over here 48 volt phantom power. So there's some microphones like your condenser microphones that need an external power source and the box will actually provide that electrical signal to your microphone. So you'll also notice on the front that there are two separate gain knobs. And what gain knobs are is they're basically volume knobs for the signal as it goes into your system. So you want to make sure that your gain knobs are such that you are not clipping or distorting the microphone. So basically what happens is if your signal is too loud going into the system, that will distort and create electronic digital noise, uh, which is, there's no way to get rid of it, really. You can do a little bit of EQing to try to minimize some of that sound, but once it's in the signal and recorded, there's no going back. So those two gain knobs are how you control that. And you'll notice that they uh, light up red and green. So red for its clipping, green for it's in a good zone. There's also a monitor control on the right side. So you can plug your headphones directly into the box and listen to the output or the input of your sound. Another great thing about this device is once you set it up, many of the meeting software that we're using right now to teach private lessons is set up in a way to be able to recognize these devices. So actually that uh, the much better sound from your computer microphone, from these fancy microphones that are gained in such a way that your instrument sound is one level and your voice is another level will actually transmit over that meeting software. And in the next episode, we'll be talking a little bit about how to change those settings inside different meeting softwares. So there's one more piece of gear that's pretty important uh, to talk about. You're gonna need some kind of microphone stand if you buy freestanding microphones. And what I mean is, you'll notice that it's attached to this boom stand here, and it has its own special clip, this microphone. For the Shure SM58, you'll notice there's a regular looking mic clip right here on the screen. There's another type of microphone stand that I think you'll find useful, and that is the type of uh, short boom that you would use for a kick drum. You can actually configure that so that it sits on your desk, and that makes for a really compact presentation of the microphone so that you don't have as much gear strewn around your uh, workspace. 
So there's one more type of device I want to talk about, and that's uh, all-inclusive USB microphone. So uh, I don't know as much about the different quality or price points of those microphones because obviously I use a modular system. The upside of a modular system is I can swap out microphones if I want to. I can change different pieces of it, and I can transport it and use it for many different applications. Um, the downside to it is you have lots and lots of gear kind of in your space. Um, a USB microphone has the audio digital converter inside it, and it runs off USB power directly into your computer. So if you're really just speaking for private lessons and you just want a little bit better quality, but you're not necessarily trying to capture a really, really high quality um, s sound of your performance, this may, might be a simpler option for you. Of course, the downside to a USB microphone is once you purchase it, you're stuck. You can't swap out different pieces of it. It's, it's just a self-contained microphone. And usually, they're not as high quality as you can get with components. So we're coming towards the end of episode one, and I want to talk about the final portion of the signal chain for our purposes. Um, so at the back of the audio digital interface, you'll have a USB connector that will go into your computer. I use a uh, MacBook Pro, but there's many different types of audio editing software for the different types of computers. So for MacBook Pro, I use Logic Pro X. That is my DAW or digital audio workstation. And inside the digital audio workstation, I'll be able to manipulate the sound so I can record and then I can cut and paste and edit and EQ and do compression and reverb and all different types of things to manipulate the sound once it's been captured. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit in episode three. Well, I hope this has helped some of you at home. I wanna give a quick caveat here. I am not a professional sound tech but I have been using this equipment for a long time. And uh, when Dave Graff talked to me about making this presentation, I thought maybe there's a couple things I've learned along the way that can help you too. As I know many of us are at home right now teaching out of our computers, and a lot of you probably have some of the same questions I did when I was starting out. So at any rate, thanks for checking this out. Uh, stick around for episode two, where we're going to be talking about many of the different meeting softwares that you can use and how to maximize uh, the sound quality from those systems for teaching private lessons.